right, everybody go ahead and stand up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Who's happy to be here? Amen. <laughs> hallelujah. My Redeemer lives. Amen. Your Redeemer live? All right. Hallelujah.
at the sound of your great name. The enemy, he has to leave at the sound of your great name. Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up. All the world will praise your great name. Your great name. All the weak know they find their strength at the sound of your great name. Souls receive grace at the sound of your great name. The fatherless, they find their rest at the sound of your great name. The sick are healed and the dead are raised at the sound your great name Jesus worthy is the lamb that was slain for us son of God and man you are high and lifted up all the world will praise your great name your great name Redeemer, my healer, Lord Almighty, my Savior, Defender, you are mine. Redeemer, my healer, Lord Almighty, my Savior, Defender, you are mine. slain for us son of God and man you are high and lifted up all the world will praise your great name your great name let's praise his name your great name your great name
God, thank God for the goodness and mercies of God. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Turn around and greet someone and tell them that God is good. And then when they tell you that, look back at them and say, all the time. Hallelujah. Y'all are just like, hey, come on, guys. God is good. I said, God is good. And all the time. Okay. En français, do est bon, tu les ton. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, we're glad to have you this morning. God he is good. And, uh, you know, last week we did not meet in person. We just went virtual last weekend. And um, <clears throat> we, we needed um, some time away. Although we were working last week virtually for, for the school system, uh, we, were, um, we were out up on the mountaintop. Hallelujah. And um, the, the nice thing about the virtual thing is you can go somewhere else and, and, and do your job. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. We hope you all enjoyed last week, but we're glad to be back in person, see you in person, and we'll, uh, we'll uh, see how long the, the, this last the Supreme Court ruling this week is going to hinder some of the uh, draconian uh, things against the church by some of these uh, Antichrist people, and um, the, the, the ruling on the Supreme Court was pretty strong, and um, and then reiterated back out to the, whatever circuit the California is under the Ninth Circuit or whatever, the lower court was ordered to re-rule based on the Supreme Court ruling of November the second in the New York case. So um, that it's, it's looking good, thank God. You know, uh, thank God that third uh, that last justice got put in there because it it swings the court to a um, favorable uh, to the church. Hallelujah. And we have a second amendment, I mean, a first amendment right to freedom of religion. Amen. Government shall pass no law, you know, establishing religion, but also right after that says, no prohibiting the free exercise thereof. 
the prohibition clause is just as strong as the establishment clause. Hallelujah. Amen. And uh, some people have used the establishment clause as a, as a battering ram against the church when right after it said, nor prohibit the free exercise thereof. And uh, so uh, we, we stand on the no prohibition on the free exercise thereof side. Amen. I don't want us to, I don't want the government to have, you know, uh, the Baptist church or the Pentecostal church or the Catholic church as a state religion. Just let us exercise our, our faith according to the constitution. Amen. Hallelujah and conscience. Praise God. Well, we're glad to see everybody this morning. Uh, we, we sure we miss seeing y'all. We, and um, keep sharing on the building fund for us to get our own place. Pastor Bob and his congregation have been so gracious to let us uh, uh, use their facility since the place we were meeting is still shut down. Uh, we, can't, we still can't go back to where we were. And, um, you know, there's, there's days I, I really like this, but there's days I like to get in there and, and be at 1030. You know, there, I would love to get to a 1030 time again. Hallelujah. But this is nice. I mean, this is it's churchy. Hallelujah. Kind of nice having churchy. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. And, and the sound issues we don't have here that we have there. Yeah. So I, I, I get it. Glory to God. Well, um, is that Gabby out there? Hey, Gabby. Good to see you. You brought somebody with you? Hey, friend of Gabby. Glad you could come. All right. Hallelujah. What's your name? Emily. Well, Emily, we're glad to have Emily this morning. Hallelujah. Tell Emily we're glad to have her. We're glad you showed up and came with Gabby. And we're glad Gabby came. Good to see Gabby. Hallelujah. And all the rest of you. Uh, we're going to receive our uh, Sunday morning tithe and offering at this time. If you need an offering envelope, raise your hand. If you're giving electronically, go ahead and get that ready. And um, send that, you know, get your PayPal or your uh, cash app. And you can send that electronically. Go ahead and give that this morning. Praise God. And um, all right. Let's pray. You know, Father, we thank you for the Word of God. We thank you that Jesus said, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, men shall give unto your bosom. We thank you the windows of heaven are open. You pour out your blessings on the people, and they walk in the light of your covenant of prosperity and blessing in Jesus' name. And because of that, the church is able to reach the nations with the gospel. Because they brought the tithe and offering to the storehouse, so there's meat available to do the work of God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, go ahead and receive that. Uh, make sure you're continuing to share the GoFundMe project online. Uh, we're going to have to be uh, praying about looking at other, other venues or ways to um, expand this uh, moving forward because you know, our building is waiting on us to come up with our money. Hallelujah. And we need the money. Hallelujah. And uh, if you win the lottery next week, go ahead and tithe. <laughs> Hallelujah. We'll go, go, we'll go buy the building. Hallelujah. If you, especially if you win the big one. If you win the 52 million, we'll go buy a building. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Glory to God. Now, don't do like I got, one guy did. He was going to uh, tithe to the church, never gave anything to the church, and then, you know, got murdered by his granddaughter and was walking around with half a million dollars in a suitcase all the time going to strip clubs and stuff. Now, you know, so that's not, you know, that's not good. That's not good. Amen. Hallelujah. Now just, you know, when down if that's hallelujah or help us Jesus, that may be a help me Jesus. What do you think, Janice? Is that a help me Jesus? Yes, yeah, help me Jesus. All right. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. All right. Don't forget Wednesday night we're continuing to teach on soteriology, the study of salvation. And this week we're going to get into justification. Remember last past week we talked about um, Faith. The week before that, we talked about repentance. This week, we're coming. We're going to be talking about justification. Hallelujah! Children's church, you guys are dismissed. I know that's probably not the right pronunciation, but I just want to use a little emphasis there. Y'all, go ahead and get your Bibles out and open them, with you will, to the hundred and third Psalm. Now, y'all do know by now. You've probably figured this out. I am not a seasonal theme preacher, okay? I'm not a holiday preacher. I'm not a calendar preacher. You know, Mother's Day comes up and I'll say Happy Mother's Day and we'll preach whatever we're preaching on, okay? I just, just the way it is. Um, I have preached some Christmas sermons in the past. I struggle to do those kind of things because um, I just don't like being tied to a theme that, you know, is kind of set by somebody else's calendar. 
I just want to follow what I believe in my heart I'm supposed to be sharing. Hallelujah. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going into an Advent sermon right now. I'm not going into an Advent series right now. Um, you know, I have, I have one Christmas sermon I've preached that I enjoy. Um, the child grew up, um, but, you know, I preach that every few years. And, uh, but I've tried to preach Mother's Day sermons. You know, it don't work for me. You know, you invite me to your church, tell me I got to preach on a certain subject, and I probably will start out there and end up somewhere else. I just do it that way. <clears throat> but, you know, we're in, a, we're in a time right now, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm amazed, quite frankly, at people and their response to what's been going on. Now, 20, we came into 2020 with the, um, you know, uh, the coronavirus sitting out there. People kind of... Um, you know, talking about it a little bit, you know, this, the, the China flu, they were calling it the China flu. And uh, of course, that was, that was deemed racist by people to, you know, to slam the president because he was calling it China flu. Well, we called it Spanish flu. We've called it bird flu. We've called it swine flu. We've called it Hong Kong flu. All the kinds of different flus we had a name for them. Basically, used on where they originated or where they originated from. This year, when they got to China, they, all of a sudden it was, it was racist. Well, you know, people just playing political games. It's, but we've got this stuff out there, and, and, and it's been, you know, politicized. To, you know, I, I told somebody the other day, think about it. This year, we have cured death by common cold, death by the regular flu, and death by old age. Because <laughs> everybody's dying of COVID-19. <laughs> Nobody's dying of anything else. I mean, you get shot in the head, you die of COVID-19. Literally, I had a teenager up in Midwest somewhere this year that was shot and killed, and because he had COVID in his system, they counted it as a COVID death. I watched the interview of the health official make the announcement. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going political, but I'm, I'm leading up to something. The news media, how many, how many are old enough to remember the Vietnam War? Now, do you remember the weekly CBS Every Friday night on the television, before they went off the air, they put wounded in action, killed in action, missing in action. The running tallies. Anybody remember that? For the week and for the war. Anybody remember that? Joe, Bill, you don't, you don't remember that? Okay. All right. Yeah, they did it every week. You know, that's the way it is. Friday, whatever, you know. <clears throat> Walter Cronkite. Did you watch NBC or CBS? I mean, ABC? You were working at night. She didn't watch it. It was programming. He didn't get to watch it. Um, and we, we came into this, this, this COVID-19, and because there was a political push behind it, the news media picked it up and began to drive this in a 24-7 news cycle. Except when there was rioting, and except when there was the, you know, the actual election or whatever. Um, and then they, as soon as that kind of said, they went right back to it. COVID this, COVID that, COVID this, COVID that, COVID this, COVID that, COVID this, COVID that. And people are sitting around watching this, reading the articles, and because the media is saying it over and 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 over again. It's beginning to wear people down. And they're beginning to get into fear about everything. They're, 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 they're afraid. Listen, it's real. I'm not saying it's not real. It's not as deadly as it made it out to be. It's a 99.6% recovery rate. Hello, your mask. Do you no good? The microns of the virus is 0.17. This is a 0.1, this is a 0.3 filter. And if you could do your math... That means it's smaller than that with this full filter. And so we're, we're in a stage at a time where people are so caught up with the news cycles. How many figured out that the media is not on your side? And now it used to be that you didn't know if the newscaster was a Democrat, Republican, Independent, or what. They gave the news. Did you know Walter Cronkite was, Cronkite was considered at one time one of the most trusted men in America? 
But he, and he was very, in his own personal ideology, he was very liberal, but it did not come across on the news media. He reported the news. Okay? And um, we've got this, these cycles of driving COVID, 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 COVID. Numbers are spiking. Numbers are spiking. Uh, you know, the, the, and they go on and on and on and on. Church, we got a problem. If we in the church are sitting around and feeding 24-7 with the news media on their information, it's going to affect you. Now, I said in the beginning that I am a virus kill zone. Why? Because the 91st Psalm says that the plague shall not come nigh my dwelling. Hallelujah. It shows up, it's got to die. It comes to Ed, it dies. Not because I'm special, but because the law, the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus overcomes the law of sin and death. And I am going to not live in fear. Now, if you go out this afternoon, you see me with a mask on. It's only because I don't want to have to stir up a bunch of arguments with somebody in a store. And did you find me on the paper tomorrow? I slapped somebody at food line. You know, come get up and my, get, get all up my grill about there wearing my mask and try to mace me. I'm going to, I might put you down. In love, of course. Yeah. I know the Bible says lay hands on no man suddenly, but I can lay them on them hard, fast, and continuously. <laughs> now I'm just being silly now. And so what I wanted to do this day is I want to talk about probably this week and next week, if we don't get through it today, which I probably won't, Healing. Because we need to combat the fear that's floating around out there, amen, about sickness and disease, particularly COVID-19 or the China flu or whatever you want, you want to call it. We need to combat that because the information you're getting is simply coming from a narrative that's bringing fear. And I believe it's been politicized for purposes that, be, that are uh, nefarious. I don't, I don't, I, you know, and we know that um, people test positive that really aren't. Hospitals get money from the government because of that relief package, the first stimulus package. There were trillions of dollars developed and money goes to, to medical fields if they get a COVID-19 case, like $13,000 a person, $39,000 if, if you go on the respirator. Well, one hospital in North Carolina um, uh, gave 81 positives, but had to give back $1.3 million because further tests show they really didn't have it. Now, you start talking about that kind of money floating around out there, and you're going to get into a system where it's scammed. But, but th that doesn't change the fact. People are being fed fear, and they're afraid, and they're, they're getting, they, they get crazy acting. People walk around macing people, sitting down with their dog in a park because they don't have a mask on. Cussing people out because they don't have a mask on. Hello? Calling the police because they don't have a mask on. And this is, this is, this is, this is fear-driven. So as the church, we're to live by faith and not by sight. So how do, how do we combat the information coming from the media, which people are now accepting, even in the church, as fact and truth, over God's Word, which has something different to say. You have to combat unbelief with faith. And the only way to do that is change where you're getting your information from. Just like faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, fear comes by hearing and hearing by the words of Satan or the enemy. That Antichrist spirit is propagating things that are contrary to what the Word of God says. So let's look in the 103rd Psalm. We'll use this, our foundation beginning. Psalm 103, verses 1 through 4. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Now stop there for a second. 
this says that God has benefits. Ed didn't say it. Preachers didn't say it. God's Word said God has benefits. So if God's Word says God has benefits, then God has benefits. And if He has benefits, then they're available to take. He's a matter of fact, we're told not to forget that he has benefits. Am I still in? I'll be distorted. I'll probably get the wide look, like that thing in Star Trek. All right. So he says there's benefits. Let's, let's look at the first one. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Go glory to God. There is no sin that God can't deal with. Hallelujah. Are you glad? Yeah. Amen. He forgives, he forgives all, all thy iniquities and healeth all thy diseases. Yeah. He redeemeth thy life from destruction and crowns thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. And we're just going to verse 5. He satisfies thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. <clears throat> now notice he says that there are benefits. And how many have a job where you got a benefit package? Got a benefit package. You know, either got retirement, they got health insurance, they got whatever where you work as part of you working there. And because you have a job there, you get benefits. And that's becoming, that's becoming, um, Less in, in this day and age than it used to be, but uh, I remember when my dad went to work for Burroughs Welcome in Greenville when they opened up their pharmaceutical manufacturing plant there, and he got a job there. They had a retirement program, a dollar per dollar match. You put a dollar in retirement, they matched it with a dollar. So if you put five hundred in this month, you got a thousand put into your account. Yeah, that was a dollar per dollar match. Why? Because they come out of New York and they didn't want the union. So they created the benefit package that made you so happy to work there, you didn't want the union there. Hello? It was cheaper for them to give you dollar per dollar match and do all this stuff and all the, you know, and, and the vacations and the days off and all that kind of stuff, all the stuff that they got for benefits than it was they had the union. And they kept the union out, never got in there. And then Glaxo bought them out about 20 years ago and uh, got, got some of their drugs and stuff and then, you know, kind of chopped it all up off the place, but he retired from there with a huge retirement glory yeah. inheritance yeah. I'm just talking, I'm just messing and he's still living on his and he retired at 59 and a half he's 85, he's still living on his retirement yeah, well, that's, that's awesome but that benefit package, well God's got benefits for the church we have benefits. One is forgiveness of sin. Another is healing of diseases. The third book of John in the second verse says this, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. Now the word wish there really is better translated pray. I pray above all things that ye prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. So here we have two passages of Scripture. One says God has the benefit of healing. Another, John, the beloved, the beloved apostle, the one that sat with Jesus, leaned against him at the, at the Last Supper, um, you know, referred to as a disciple that Jesus loved, uh, says, I pray above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And we can go down, down the path of that, you know, soul prosperity, studying the Word, having your mind renewed to the Word of God, those kind of things, all important. Um, but the fact is, he's praying that we would financially prosper and that we would be physically well, above all things, in relationship to your soul prosperity, which is your walk with the Lord. Now, these are strong statements. Now, I know that the church world has taught for some time, you know, that, you know, God put that on you. You don't know why. And God makes people sick. We don't know why. And God kills people. We don't know why. And that's enough to make you vomit because it's not biblical. 
And they try to sound so spiritual. You never know what the Lord's going to do. Yeah, I do. I got a Bible. It tells me what God's going to do. Hello? Just read it. You know, you know, like, like, wow, I could have had a V8. Well, I could have read a scripture. Got an answer. It's amazing what happens when you go look in the Bible and find an answer. <clears throat> and so God, God wants you well. <clears throat> let's, let's go into this further. God wants you well so much. God wants you healthy so much that he used the exact same sacrifice that he used to forgive sin to heal your body. Look, if you will, to the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah. Because Jesus bore your sin and sickness at the same time. The 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah. And we'll, we'll, we'll have two companion passages to this. And they being Matthew 8, 16 and 17 and 1 Peter 2, 24. And if y'all have been in the church for a while, you know these. You could probably preach this for me, but that's all right. I'm up here today, so I get to do it. <laughs> Isaiah 53, starting in verse uh, 3, says, He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Hallelujah. Um, okay. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Hallelujah. Let's back up to the third. Now, if you're reading out of the King Jimmy, now that is the King James Version, you know, often referred to as the AV, the authorized version. Hallelujah. The King James never finally authorized he authorized this beginning. He never, he never sanctioned the final copy. Hallelujah. Um, it says here, he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows. And that in the uh, Hebrew is, um, is literally um, pains. Pains. Now, I, so I don't have it written here. There's, I've changed Bibles, so I don't have it written here. I used to have it in there. Mechab and, and Koile. I believe, but Makab, M-A-K-O-B, the English transliteration of the Hebrew lettering, uh, is the word translated griefs here, which really means pains. And then uh, he was, he was, um, he borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, but pains, and then carried our sorrows, uh, koile sicknesses. In the Hebrew, the first translation for this word is sicknesses. Okay? Now, Bill, am I right? Macabre and Corley? Did I have that right? You were, okay, thank you. That's my walking uh, thesaurus back there. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. So, so we have Corley and Macabre. I think Corley is C-H-O-I-L-Y. Now, remember, these are English letter transliterations of the Hebrew lettering. You know, we don't, we don't really read that real good. I don't know about you. I don't. Left, right to left, and all that stuff. Anyway. Hallelujah. Surely he hath borne our pains, macabre, and carried our sorrows, koile, sicknesses. So let's read it that way because that's the way it is in Hebrew. Now, you, these words are other translations of that word, but um, I'll bear out that it's talking about sicknesses here from the other scriptures. Okay? Um, he says, surely hath borne our pains, carried our sicknesses, yet we did esteem him stricken, uh, smitten of God and <clears throat> smitten, stricken, 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 smitten of God and afflicted. 
He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes or wounds, <clears throat> he but there's wounds, we are healed. Now here, this, now let's think about this. This is Isaiah looking to the cross that's coming. Prophecy. This event has not taken place. He's by, by, by prophetic utterance, by the anointing of the Holy Ghost, is looking forward to Calvary, where Jesus, the suffering servant, is on the cross and says, he prophesies that and says <clears throat> that the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Our iniquities are on him. He's bruised for our iniquities. And by his stripes we're healed. <clears throat> and so look, if you will, to Matthew 8. You kind of you mark your place there in Isaiah. We may come run, running back over there. Matthew chapter 8. We get down into verse 16. Now, when evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. Now, I don't know about you. The Bible believes in people being demon possessed. We don't believe in that. Well, the Bible did. Jesus cast devils out, demons out. And he cast out the spirits with his word. They weren't mentally ill. They were demon-possessed. Now, some of y'all remember the exorcist as, as kids. Linda Blair and the exorcist and the, all that, you know. And, and um, they probably had it more right than people wanted to admit. Then the omen. The omen came out in that same time era. Um, he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick that it might be fulfilled by that which was spoken by Isaiah. Now, this, remember, this is the Greek form of Isaiah translated into English. So it's Isaiah. It's talking about Isaiah. The prophet saying, himself took our infirmities and what? Bear our sicknesses. He's bearing out that the word koile should be translated sicknesses back there in um, Isaiah 53. Notice. Now, you got people come along and go, well, you know. People who try to be theological and put on that voice, well, the reference to by his stripes you were healed in the Old Testament is in reference to the spiritual sickness of sin. That's not what I, Matthew said. That's not what Matthew said. Matthew said that he healed all that were sick. That it might fulfill Isaiah. Hello? Bear our sicknesses. So you can take your PhDs and all your little letters and get your fancy voice, and it doesn't change the meaning of the Bible. See, we got more people trying to talk us out of Bible than we are to talk us into it. Part of that, as Dr. Bill shared with me in an article he was giving me recently, comes out of that German critical thinking stuff from the early 20s uh, uh, that, that began to see the Bible as not the Word of God, not authoritative, it's supposed to be disputed and dissected and you know, intellectualized, basically, and argued that why, why it's not real. <clears throat> That'll get you in more trouble than you can get out of. That'll get you in hell. One-way ticket. Hello. So we have here, well, now let's, let's take one more verse, 1 Peter 2.24. 1 Peter 2.24. So we have Matthew, I mean, um, Isaiah looking forward to the coming suffering servant. We have the servant in ministry acting on Isaiah 53. And then we have Peter in doctrine affirming the fulfillment of prophecy. Okay. First Peter 2 and verse 20. Um, well, we could, we could really look here at um, 
21. For even here, uh, here unto, that's 1 Peter 2, 21 through 24. Ye were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither were guile, was there guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. What's that talking about? Carried our sins at the cross, should live unto righteousness. So he bore our sin so we could live what? unto righteousness. But he didn't stop there. Why? Because Isaiah 53 didn't stop there. By whose stripes ye were healed. Now, let's, let's stop here. The naysayers will come along, like we said, and try to say, well, that's referring to the spiritual sickness of sin. And if we didn't have Matthew 8, they might would get away with it. But Matthew 8 makes it clear that Isaiah's reference was to physical sicknesses. The, re the reference of Isaiah 53, 5, 3, 3, 4, 5, was to fit by his stripes, he are healed. We are healed. That was a prophecy of the coming event. Peter comes and acknowledges its fulfillment and is now instituted as doctrine in the church that he bore our sin in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. He has now affirmed Isaiah 53's prophecy as a doctrinal activity of the church. Matthew, in the experiential demonstration of, of, of Isaiah, declares vehemently, without reserve, without any argument, that he healed their sick, that it might be fulfilled, but which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Yes. You can't argue around it. You can't spiritualize it. Hello. You cannot deny that the reference of Isaiah 53, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, where by the stripes of Jesus, you being healed, one was a prophecy, one was a fulfillment, had a reference to anything other than actual physical sicknesses. Now, notice this from Psalm 103 who forgiveth all thy iniquities and healeth all thy diseases. Matthew, I mean, I keep wanting to run to Matthew. Isaiah, he, uh, he bore our iniquities. Amen. He was bruised for our iniquities. Chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. First Peter 2, 24, who his own self bare our sins and his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Notice there's a theme going on here. What theme is that? That God dealt with sin and sickness in the same sacrifice. Hello, Jesus. The exact same sacrifice that bore our sin was the exact same sacrifice that took our sicknesses. This is the theme we're picking up here. And you can't really get around it. It's there. Um, <clears throat> Brother Hagin used to preach a sermon, and, I, and I've, I've kind of gone that way before. You know, uh, forgiveness and healing, God's double cure. <coughs> Praise the Lord. Because <coughs> God has made it clear from his word that Jesus came to bear our sin, to carry and to take our sicknesses. Now, People come along, well, that healing stuff passed away, then forgiveness passed away. You can't have it both ways. You can't have it that we still get forgiven, but we don't get healed anymore. Why? Because it was the same sacrifice. The scriptures did not delineate a limitation on the healing, healing of humanity and leave open the forgiveness of humanity. 
So when I do that, when I see that Jesus was my sacrifice for my sin, and then I see that he was my sacrifice for my sicknesses, then I can have faith to receive either one. Forgiveness and healing. Because the Word of God makes it plain. Now, let's go, let's go to James chapter 5. You're not far from James right there. Like two pages back. <coughs> Look down here in verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Mary, let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Well, just let him go in the corner and cry and bawl and squall and wonder why God put that on him and never know why it happened. God has some reason he just can't understand. What Bible y'all reading? You got one of them newfangled versions? Hello? No, that's not what it said. Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith, now this, now I'm going to come back here in just a minute and do a little quick Greek thing here. Shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he's committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. So he can't be talking about the spiritual sickness of sin. Now, the word save, we, we've, I've taught you this, and I've taught you this, and I've taught you this, but because... I'm teaching the subject. I'm going to teach it again. It's sozo in the Greek. And the sozo word group, <clears throat> of which it, sozo is the head word, soterius is the noun in that word group. But it, it, it implies um, Schofield in his, his study, Dr. Schofield, says that the word sozo carries the implication of forgiveness of sin, he, uh, healing from diseases, deliverance from temporal evils, Hello, and there's some other things in there, but I just want to hit on those major ones right there. Okay? So we have here, it says save or literally make whole or heal the sick. Because that, that word translated save right here, it's the same word translated heal in other places or made whole in other places in the New Testament. Okay? So the prayer of faith shall what? Heal the sick. I'm not, I'm not rewriting the Bible. It's the same Greek word. This is the meanings of that word. Okay, the, the King Jimmy translators chose save, but you could just as easily have chosen heal. And in the context, it really is heal. So, uh, is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. And I'll just move that out of the way since it's not on television. And I know it won't bother you, it bothers me. Hallelujah. Notes fell out of my Bible. Anointing with oil in the name of the Lord. What did Jesus give the commission to the church? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. He that believeth and baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. Amen. Okay. And he goes on this several things. Then he says this. And they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. In my name they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Can y'all think of another word in the English language that conveys a stronger going to do it than shall? Just a singular word. And so the word shall, representing the, its Greek counterpart, it is they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Hello? Didn't say they might. Didn't say you never know what God's going to do. Here's the problem. We don't preach that to people. We tell them, well, you just never know what God's going to do. So there's no basis of faith. And when there's no basis for faith, there's no way to receive because faith is the receiver. Hello. If people don't have a basis for faith, they can't have faith. Y'all act like a bunch of Presbyterians out there. Come on now. We Pentecostal. We Holy Ghost folk around here. <clears throat> Let's get some light. Amen. All right. I'm just teasing the Presbyterians. 
They pick, listen, I pick on us too. Some of us crazy nutbag people hanging from the chandeliers and stuff. So he shall save the sick and God shall raise them up. And if he's committed sin, they'll be forgiven him. If. So that cannot mean he was talking about getting rid of all their sin when they came in and did all that because they may not even have any. If he's committed sin, they've been forgiven him. Now, if means you may have, may not have. But if he's sick, if there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord, and they shall, and, and they shall, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, heal the sick. So here we have this. Sicknesses can be dealt with. Now, listen, sickness, disease, infirmity, any ailment of the body. You understand what we're talking about here? God wants you well. Think of the 100 and, um, 105th Psalm, I believe it is. Or the 100, the 100, um, Is 105th, verse 35, there was not feeble, he brought them out and there was not one feeble one among the tribes. Hello. 119th Psalm, 100th, verse 135. Somebody help me out there. You're working. Little Bill's slowing the draw back there. Huh? 35 of, it's either 35 or 135 of, Verse, Psalm 105, verse 37. Okay. I was around there somewhere. Notice that. He brought them forth with silver and gold, and there was not one feeble one among their tribes. <clears throat> now, how many of you have ever seen Cecil B. DeMiles, the Ten Commandments? Got them coming out blind. Got them coming out on walkers. You know, got them on, you know, stretchers. It ain't accurate. They all came out under their own steam. There was no feeble one among them. Hello. See, God's plan is for us to be well, strong, healthy. And he's made provision for that through Jesus Christ and the stripes laid on him where he bore all that stuff that the devils tried to put on you. Now, let me say this. We're not just talking about minor ailments, you know, a headache or a stomach ache. You know, God, and God's concerned about that too. Are you here? But I'm talking about cancer. I'm talking about COVID-19. I'm talking about leukemia. I'm talking about anything you can think of that, that when you hear the word, you think death sentence. I've got scripture. There's a life sentence. There is life to your body. There is life to the cells in your body. That is more powerful than the, you know, cancer and its perversion and distorting of the, of, the, uh, of the cell DNA and the cell structure and how it turns on itself and begins to work against the body. There is something greater than cancer. It's called the Word of God. And because Jesus bore that in his body, by his stripes ye are healed. <clears throat> Amen. He delivers us from that. He delivers us from injury. He delivers us from all the works of the enemy. Amen. 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 Why? Because God loves his creation. Yes, he does. God was never intended to live sick or defeated or broke or poor or, 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 or um, you know, in a, in a state of lesser than perfection, really. Our bodies, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, are the temple of the Holy Ghost. We're the dwelling place of the Holy Ghost. We're bought with a price. Your body's bought with a price. Hello? You are not required as a Christian to choose between being spiritually strong and physically weak. God's made provision so you can be, actually, you're better off. To, you're, it's easy to be spiritually strong when you're physically strong. Yeah. Well, God, this this to me. He, he broke my neck and put me in a wheelchair so he could, he could use me for his glory. 
Repeat after me. Gag, a maggot. I'm sorry. <clears throat> First of all, Jesus, anybody know who Jesus is? Head of the church, second person of the Godhead, God manifest in the flesh. Remember him? Yeah. Now the high priest over the church, seated at the right hand of the Father. He said, the thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. So your neck being broken, stole. In many cases, kills. It does destroy. The thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, destroy. I am come. So the antithesis to Satan's work is I've come to give life and give it more abundantly. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. So, you know, I, I've, I'm, you know here's, here's one side of this. I am grateful to people who experienced tragedy and did not lose their faith in God, that he, he loves them, that he cares for them. I don't like it when they blame him for it and say he had some reason they just don't understand. Because that produces unbelief in people. Actually, I'm going to tell you what else it does. It'll run people away. You know, there are going to be people who, why would I want to serve a God that's going to break my neck? I mean, how many, would you, how many would you want to be one of the siblings of the parents whenever somebody did something that you, that they, and the parents went in and just broke one of the other siblings' necks because they had some special purpose? Took your brother, broke his neck. Okay, why'd you do that? That's for me to know. I'm the daddy. I have an ulterior purpose in him breaking his neck. Hello? I know what you're doing. You're out the next night. You have packed up and hit the road, Jack. Because it might be coming for you next. Hello? God is good. Can you say that? God is good. Jesus, we said earlier, was made sin that we might be made righteous. He was made sick with our diseases, that we might be whole. Look at Galatians, the third chapter. We've already read Matthew 8, 17. Um, we won't reiterate that one again, but let's go to Galatians. Now, in order to understand Galatians 3, you need to read Deuteronomy 28. Amen? Amen. I'm not going to do it. Deuteronomy 28, verses uh, 15 through the end of the chapter. <clears throat> Remember the first part? If you hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and keep all of his commandments, then all these blessings will come on you. You'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the country, blessed in the field, blessed in this, blessed in everything you set your hand to, blessed, uh, blessed in your cattle and blessed in your kind, blessed in the oil. I mean, blessed, 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 blessed. Verse 14 ends. But! If you hearken not unto the voice of the Lord thy God and fail to keep all these commandments this day which he commandeth thee, then all these curses will come on ye. Curse shall you be in the... And they spend the next 45 verses talking about them. Anybody ever read that? Yeah. Now, as new charismatic, word of faith, New Testament Christians, we love verses 1 through 14, glory to God, because we believe we're under the blessing and not under the curse. And there's a reason we believe we're under the blessing and not under the curse. And I'm going to tell you something. There is some stuff in that curse you don't want. Let me name one, the M-Rods. Y'all know what that is, don't you? Got to have preparation H. All right? We don't want the M-Rods. I mean, all kinds of stuff are going to come on people who, who did not walk according to the Word of God. But the, the, here we come. Well, you see, God, you know, blah, 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 blah. look at verse, chapter 3, verse 13 of Galatians. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having been made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now, I just told you where to find the curse. Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 through 61. 
and there's a bunch of it out there. Hello? It ain't good. I mean, you're going to be, I mean, boils are going to come on you and all kinds of stuff. But we're redeemed from the curse. I said we are redeemed from the curse. What for? See, not only did he redeem us for a curse, there was a purpose in redeeming us from the curse. That the blessing of Abraham, that was just for the Jews, might come on the Gentiles. Hallelujah. Through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That was just for the Jews. Well, he didn't say it was for the Jews. As a matter of fact, he said that the, the, it might get on the Gentiles too. We are redeemed from the curse of the law. I'm not under the curse. Can you say, I'm not under the curse? I'm not under the curse. I'm not under the curse. The blessing comes on me. And man, the blessing is something else. Blessed in everything you set your hand to. We look in. We see Jesus bearing our sicknesses. We see in the psalmist declare with boldness and authority that Jesus bore our sicknesses and carried our diseases, that by his stripes we are healed. Amen? Can you say amen to that? He redeemed us from the curse of the law. It's just as much God's will to heal as it is for us to be saved. Now, Jesus says in John 6, 38, remember that? I came down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me. Okay. Now, I challenge you. I challenge you out there on Facebook this morning. Go find one recorded incident in the Bible, in the New Testament, in the ministry of Jesus where he made somebody sick. We walked up to some guy just walking down the road who's perfectly wealthy, I mean healthy, healthy, perfectly strong, and walks up to him and lays hands on him and it breaks his legs. Why? Why can't you find that? Jesus said, I do not, I say, I only do those things which I see my father do. Now, according to some modern theologians, God's making people sick. God's breaking people's necks. But God's running over kids. God's killing people. You didn't see, you don't have Jesus walking up to one person and killing them. And then turning to their family saying, I have a divine purpose in that and walking away. I don't, have a biblical record of a lot of theological garbage that people preach today. I do have a biblical record of him going to the infirmed, going to the demon possessed, going to the crippled, the injured, and delivering them from that oppression. Um, let me see if this is in my notes. I'm not. Okay. The woman in the temple that Jesus healed. That's not in my notes, but I got to go there. Are we getting there yet? Somebody found it for me? Huh? The woman, that, the woman, Abraham, being a daughter of Abraham. Somebody found it for me yet? Oh, not this woman being a daughter of Abraham. Well, tell, I, I, can't, I can't see that. Luke 13. I need somebody to tell me what it is so I can just go get it. Luke 13. But there's not a screen back in this building over here. Let's look at this. Verse 
Verse 10. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity. Not only was it she infirm, it was a spirit, demonic spirit on her. 18 years and was bowed together and couldn't know in no wise lift herself up. You ever seen anybody with like, you know, you know, we've got people with osteoporosis and I remember when I was at Raymond, we had a girl with sway back. Her back was backwards. It was, it was terrible, crippling. Um, and when Jesus saw her, he called him to him, he called her to him and said unto her, now look at me. Modern theology teaches us that God does stuff to people for, for reasons we don't understand. But Jesus calls her and says, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Now stop there. He didn't say, God has some reason you just keep being faithful and you'll figure it out. Or if you don't, when you get to heaven, you'll understand why he did this to you. He looked at her and said, come here. You're loosed. And laid hands on her and set her free. I only do those things which I see my father do. We do not have a scriptural reference to a reversal of this process. What do you mean? Jesus going into the synagogue, finding somebody there that's, that's been faithful to God, walking around, laying hands on them, and making them, uh, putting a spirit of infirmity on them. So what can I deduct? If I don't have a biblical record, hello? If I don't have a biblical record of Jesus doing it, then why are we saying today that God does it? When Jesus himself said, I only do those things which I see the Father do. And the word of God says, God of himself testifies, I am the Lord, I change not. He doesn't change. Hello? We didn't come along all of a sudden get to the new, the 20th century church where everybody's got a bunch of letters behind their name and God became a, a, a mean God. They're <coughs> going make you get cancer, teach you something. Now, here's what happens. The moment you think God did it, there's no way you can have faith to get rid of it. Hello? Because if you believe God put it on you, there's no way you can have faith that he's going to take it off of you. Particularly with the underlying thought that many people teach in the church that he's doing it for some unknown reason. That you just don't understand. Well, that's messing with my theology. Good! Because if that's your theology, it needs to be messed with. Hello? Now let's go on because we, we don't, we don't want to stop there. And here come the religious folk. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation. My God, you talk about lack of compassion. Here's a woman that's been coming to his synagogue for 18 years, bowed over. And Jesus comes and she gets healed and he gets ticked off. Because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. And said to the people, there are six days in which men ought to work. And then therefore come and be healed and not on the Sabbath. You arrogant hypocrite. You were ticked off because he showed you up and you hadn't done anything for this woman in 18 years. He walks in and she gets healed. Answered with indignation. Of course, Jesus didn't put up with it. And then Jesus answered and said to him, Thou hypocrite, 
Doth not each one of you on the Sabbath day loose an ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, underline this next phrase, being a daughter of Abraham whom Satan hath bound. Lo, these 18 years be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day. And all they heard these things and his adversaries were ashamed. And all the people rejoiced for the glorious things that were done by him. Hallelujah. <coughs> Two things here. <clears throat> what does, who does Jesus attribute the sickness or the infirmity to? Ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham. What's that? That is a phrase referencing she's in covenant with God. She's under the Abrahamic covenant. Whom Satan hath bound. Not God. Satan. Whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years. This woman is a covenant right to be loosed. from Satan's oppression. So Jesus makes it clear that infirmity, sickness, disease is satanic oppression of the physical body. That doesn't necessarily mean you got a demon sitting on you, putting COVID on you. It just means that it's a work of him in the earth. Hello. You don't necessarily have to have a demon on you. Notice that God, God, God knows how the devil works. And when he said, you know, that um, he talked about all the books, all the things that are in the book and the ones that aren't even written yet. He said, hey, all these sicknesses will come on you. Now, that's the God study the tenses of the verb in the Hebrew, allowed, and not, not allowed because he was putting it on you, but because you opened the door to it. Listen, if you go out here in the, in the parking lot and you left your car unlocked and let the windows down and had your purse sitting in the front seat and somebody walked up there and took it out, there ain't nobody to blame but you. Hello. Because you allowed them to do it. You just put it right there for them. I remember back when we were in, um, in our church in Greenville, there was this mom, she got up one night and started arguing with the pastor. She was mad because her daughter's East Carolina University textbooks got stolen from the student union. You know how they got stolen? The daughter stood up, left them on the table there in the student union, college students, and said, angels, watch my, my books, and walked off and left them and came back and they were gone. <clears throat> Anybody know what SOS means? Now, on nautical terms, it means save our ship. In this case, it means stupid on steroids. <clears throat> Hello. God did not send angels to watch your textbooks because you're too lazy to carry them away. <clears throat> going to put the ain at, at East Carolina Student Union. You got kids there that are going, man, I needed that book. It was $200. Mine now. My angel is supposed to guard that. No, angels don't. It's like telling the angels to go cut your, fr your grass. <laughs> God didn't send angels to cut your grass. I call them granola Christians. Fruits, nuts, and flakes all packaged together in a box under the same label. Dummy. Now, this woman is a daughter of Abraham, and she has a covenant right. How do you know? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name and forget not his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction. She's a daughter of Abraham. She's in covenant with God. She's got a right to the what? The benefits. I'm in Christ. 
Well, that was for the Jews. Did we just read to you Galatians? Hello? Did we read Galatians? That we've been redeemed from the curse of the law, Christ being made a curse for us, for it's written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. Amen. So what's that mean? I qualify for the benefits. Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, faith begins where the will of God is known. If you believe God made you sick, if God injured you, if God did that to you, if God put that on you, you have no basis for faith that he's going to take it away from you. You'll be approaching it in wishing so, hoping so, maybe so, but never in it is so. Now, Romans, I believe Romans, I'm looking at Romans 4, but I don't think it's there. No, that's not there. That's, that's, it's, it's along the lines of faith. It's not there. Um, all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen. Let me know when y'all have it up on the screen, Belinda. What did she say? All right, 2 Corinthians one twenty. For all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. Now, the Weymouth translation says it this way. All the promises of God, whatever their number, find the yes in him. And our amen, what does amen mean? Anybody know what amen means? So be it. Our amen acknowledges its truth to the glory of God in us. Makes it a little plainer. All the promises of God, whatever their number, find the yes in him. And our amen acknowledges its truth to the glory of God in us. The Francis Weymouth translation. I love that translation. New Testament and modern speech is, is, that, is, is uh, what he titled it. Okay? And so... By his stripes, we were healed. The benefit of God is he healeth all our diseases. And when we come to God, you don't come to God. I've shared this before. and We'll we're, we're, we're wrap here. We'll come pick up here next week. I shared this. That back in, in, in the height of the, the healing revival, back in the 40s and 50s, um, the Anglican church of England. Now you understand the Anglican Church of England is the head of the Anglican Communion, of which the Episcopal Church of America is part of the Anglican Communion. You got the African Communion. Uh, but the, the Church of England is the head of it all. <clears throat> okay. And, it's, and in England they, and, and other parts of the world, they refer to it as Anglican. Uh, I think only in America we refer to it as Episcopal. But everywhere else they refer to it as Anglican. And um, this became a worldwide phenomenon. They call it a phenomenon. People were going, going to meetings, going to tents, going to places, and getting healed of, of, of incurable diseases. Miracles. I mean, just recorded miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. All over the world, this thing was worldwide. The healing revival began in the end of World War II in 1946 and lasted until about 1957. And um, it was all over. God was doing stupendous things. But the Episcopal Church or the Anglican Church of England uh, set a council to go study this phenomena. Because they wanted, you know, they wanted to, and after three years, they had three years they studied this. That's so about an 11 year revival. And then th so in that thing, somewhere they did a three year study. And they came back, and here's their report. <clears throat> after studying this for, you know, three years, da 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 da, 
we have, we have come to the conclusion we can no longer use the faith-destroying phrase, if it be thy will, when praying in reference to divine healing. How does if it be thy will? Because you don't know his will. If you don't know his will, you're not in faith. You, can't, you, you may wish, you may be hoping it's true. You ever been watching a basketball game? You know, you're watching Carolina and Duke, and Duke's losing because of the typical cheating that Duke, I mean, Duke's winning because of the typical cheating they do, and Carolina's got the ball for the last possession. They might get it in the basket and win the game. But there's a half a second on the clock, and they got to throw it in and have somebody shot, throw it all the way down the other end of the court and go into the net from 80 feet away, you know, and to win the game. Now, you, got, you ain't got no basis for faith that's going to happen. You're hoping. you wishing. you think thinking by some hook or crook it might just happen. Likely it's not going to because the officials are going to call you for too long with the ball or something because it's, you know, it's five on eight. Some of y'all get that later. Five on eight. Three officials, five Duke players, five Carolina players. Five versus eight. I don't have any sour grapes about with those games. Hallelujah. But you have no, even if they threw it up there and it went in and Carolina wins and everybody's going crazy, you can't go. I knew it was going to happen. No, you didn't. It, that was just one of those things, that, you know, the law of, of, of averages, that you throw it that way enough times, eventually sometimes it's going to go in. I remember the game where Mike, uh, back in um, 75, 76, when, um, what was his Walter, Walter something, played for Carolina. Um, I can't remember his last name now. Played in the NBA for years. Um, but Carolina was losing about eight points with 17 seconds left, and they tied it at the buzzer. Two-point game back then. They didn't have three, three, you know. Yeah. Eight, 17 seconds, they got eight points back. Duke hit the clock. Uh, Walter Davis. Walter Davis gets the ball. You know, he got it, got it down to two points, got the possession back. Walter Davis shoots from the, ha the side hash mark, and as it leaves his hand, the clock goes off and hits it, swishes, nothing but net. Ties it up. I won't go in. I knew it. I knew it. You know what I'm saying? I don't believe it. I don't believe it. <laughs> there was no basis for faith for me to believe that Carolina was going to come back from eight points down in 17 seconds. Just, there was no, there was no. Even, forget the officials. It could have been high school team and you still would have a hard time making that happen. Hello? When we approach the subject of healing with God as a, I don't know if he wants me well or not, you're in trouble because you don't have any faith. Now, 99.9% .9 of Christians who say that, if you ask them, believes God can. All right, I need another scripture. Master, if thou wilt, I know thou canst make me whole. And the answer is, <laughs> ding. <coughs> Survey says, Mark chapter 1, verse 40. And there came a leper him to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Stop. Let me, you me put that in the English, modern English. Leper came to him and said, Jesus, I know you can, but are you willing? See, it wasn't God's power 
or people believing that God has the power that was keeping this guy from receiving anything. It was his lack of knowledge of knowing whether or not God wanted to or was willing to. Next verse. I will be thou made whole. Survey says, and Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and saith unto him, I will. Now, be thou clean. What did he have to address before anything? He had to address the question that the guy had. He knew he could. We sing the song. Anything, yes, anything, anything, yes, anything, my God can do anything. He made the earth in all its fullness. He made the sunshine and the rain. My God can do anything. Yeah, we all believe that. God can do anything. He's God. Will he? That's the question. It's not can he. You can, get, you can get an atheist. Well, if there is a God, I don't believe in God, but if it was a God, God was real, he could. Because he's God, he'd be God. The demons believe and tremble. Knowing God can is not enough. You must know that he will. And so Jesus looks at this guy, he's moved with compassion, puts his hand, touches him, but he says, I will be thou clean. It wasn't the guy's belief in the power of God. It was his guy's lack of knowledge and the willingness or the will of God that was his hindrance. And that's why we say you got to go to the Word. Yeah. That's why you have to understand that by the stripes of Jesus, you were healed. Yeah. That's why you have to understand that God did it for you. That <clears throat> you have all his benefits and you're not to forget his benefits. That you're in covenant with God through Jesus Christ, glory to God. If you be Christ... Then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, Galatians 3.29. Go down to Galatians 3.29.28 down there. Remember back up earlier that chapter, he says, um, and he saith not to seeds as of many, but seed as one, which is Christ. And he gets at the end and says, and if you be Christ possessive, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Go back. Redeem us from the curse of the law that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. Amen. I said amen. So God has ordained as a benefit your physical health and wholeness. All the promises of God whatever their number, find the yes in him. And our, amen, or acknowledging it as a reality, our amen acknowledges its truth to the glory of God in us. In other words, it makes it real to you in person. Amen? Amen. We're going to, have to stop here this week, and uh, we'll pick up next week, and we'll finish. But this morning, uh, we want to pray for anybody that, that you need the hands laid on you because you're sick, you're injured, you're, you know, you want, you want us to minister to you. After hearing this this morning, your um, God's Word's been made real. Hallelujah. It's God's will. Those of you at home will pray for you, too. Hallelujah. Anybody need for us to pray for you this morning? Come on. Hallelujah.
Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. While y'all are coming, I'm going to go ahead. Those of you watching by, by uh, TV or the, by the Internet, <clears throat> now listen. There's no um, special power in putting your hand on your television or on your computer screen or whatever. But as a point, what Roberts used to say, it's a point of contact. You have to release your faith. <clears throat> Here, we're going to lay hands on them and touch them, and they, at that point, you release your faith. Amen? Here, we want you to do this. I'm going to pray for you right now. Those watching by, by, uh, by uh, electronic means, we pray for you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Speaking God's will over your life, that by the stripes of Jesus, ye were healed. And I right now, in the name of Jesus, decree that you're made whole from the top of your head to the soles of your feet through the stripes of Jesus and command you be made every whit whole now. Now release your faith. because Jesus says, I will be thou made whole in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Now these up here, uh, when I lay hands on you, don't, don't try to do anything weird. Just, just let, the, let God minister you. And at that point, Know this, we're laying hands on you. Jesus, Jesus said, they shall lay hands on the sick, <clears throat> infirm, injured, and they shall be made, and they shall be healed. When I lay hands on you, the healing power of God is going to come on you. Just let it go. Let it flow. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. I, I, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how that feels. Just, just say, I, I receive it. When I lay hands on you, just in your heart, say, I receive it. It's mine. Jesus <clears throat> bore that for me. Hallelujah. And, the, and I lay hands on you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I command you from the top of your head to the soles of your feet to be made every whit whole in Jesus' name. Be made in the name of Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I lay hands on you in accordance with the word of God. It says, by the stripes of Jesus, you were healed. And it also says that I lay hands on you and you shall recover. I thank you, Father, right now in the name of Jesus. Your healing power goes into this man and makes him every whit whole in Jesus' name. Amen. And I lay hands on you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. You're made every whit whole by the power of God. Be healed in Jesus' name. And I thank you right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I lay hands on you in Jesus' name. And I thank you that every vertebrae is aligned properly. I thank you that all the tension goes in the name of Jesus. I thank you numbness flees in Jesus' name. And that you're made whole by the power of God, in Jesus' name, pain go, numbness go, health and whole and restoration come. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, 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 amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Now, the first thing you don't do is let the devil try to rob you. You go, you didn't get anything. Jesus said, you shall recover. Hallelujah. He said, you shall recover. Amen. Shall. Everybody say, shall. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Anybody want to test? Anybody got a testimony? Well, you know, right then something happened that you know. Yes. Stop. Praise God. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right. Anybody else minister to? Anybody on Facebook? You pray for you. Pray. You, you, you know something out there? Hallelujah. Anybody else? Okay. Well, you're recovering. Hallelujah. You said you shall recover. It's gone up, and the rest of it goes too. And complete restoration is how it is. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up. Hallelujah. Next week, we'll pick up here. We're going to receive the Lord's table right now. Let's all, let's, let's, can we create the line for receiving communion, the Holy Eucharist? <clears throat> As we say, if you're born again, if you're a child of God, you are welcome to join us in our church service for communion. We do not limit it to people within our own body because we believe anybody that's born again believer has access and right to the covenant communion table of God. If y'all come, if you want, we're going to receive the Lord's table this morning. Hallelujah. Amen.
All right, guys, a bunch of stuff here. We need to get it, kind of spread it out. The Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corneth. Paul had strong things to say to that church because they were, they were bozos sometimes. But they were also zealous for God. We had, had kind of an interesting thing. They were zealous and bozos all at the same time. Okay. Yeah, we've been there. I mean, beginning of the book, he goes, you come behind and no gift. He's praising them. Then he gets over here in this chair and goes, shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. <laughs> I mean, you know, so he, he had to deal with all kinds of stuff with these guys. But we get here in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He gets down to verse 23. He says, I received of the Lord that which I delivered unto you. That the, same, uh, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also, he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup <coughs> is a New Testament or a new covenant in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever eateth, eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat and drink of that cup. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation or condemnation to himself, not deserting the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. But if we should judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home. Then you come together not unto condemnation, and the rest I will set in order when I come. Paul was straightening out some stuff they were doing in the church and re reaffirming the purpose of the, the Eucharist, the communion table. We look at this cracker, and as you know, this cracker was stuck together with others, had little holes pierced in it, and it broke apart. The Bible says, they looked at him whom they pierced. You can see on the sides, you see what the piercings went through, so this would cook. Unleavened bread won't cook unless you pierce it. It won't cook. It won't cook. But because it's unleavened, it cooks uneven. And so you get stripes across it as it cooks. By stripes, we were healed. Amen? This is my body, which is broken for you. Healing belongs to us in the covenant table. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen. He took the bread, he break it, and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Let us eat together. He took the cup. Messiah's cup. This cup is the New Testament, New Covenant in my blood. Forgiveness of sin, ratification of the covenant is in the blood of Jesus. This do you as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Amen. Let us drink. We are in covenant with God. Can you say Amen. <clears throat> a covenant of forgiveness, a covenant of health, a covenant of deliverance, a covenant of wholeness in the name of Jesus. 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 Hmm? Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Don't you let go. Don't you let go for a second. Your faith is strong, 
and that which you have sown and that which you've imparted shall not come back void, says the Lord. Hallelujah. But that which you have sown in tears and in faith shall bring a harvest and restoration and fullness will come in the name of Jesus. Stand strong, woman of God. Stand strong in your faith and stand still in that place of rest knowing I will work it and make it and bring it to pass. Ha, 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 ha. And there'll be great joy. There'll be great joy in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! They might make one again run around the room. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Why does God do that? Sometimes people just need a, uh, ain't just send a little Holy Ghost pick, right, pick me upper. You know what you're doing is right. You know you're doing what's the right thing. Sometimes it's just good to hear it. Not that you have to have it. I've already done that. So you were there with the kids. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. How many love Jesus? Oh, glory to God. Say, I love Jesus. Yes, I do. I love Jesus. How about you? <laughs> Amen. A little Carmen on the, on the way out the door. Amen. Glory to God. God is good. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Amen. Emily, we're glad you came today, honey. Thank you for coming. Gabby, it's good to see you, sweetie. Jonathan's here. Good to see you, Jonathan. Hey, buddy. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We sure love all of you. We bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. May his blessings overtake you. His countenance shine upon you. May everything you set your hand to prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, if I lay hands on you today, you say, I receive. I'm, I'm, I recover. I recover in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Go your way. Remember these words from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Go with God in Jesus' name. We love you. See you next time here at Faith and Victory Church. Glory to God.